Okay. So what we are going to do is we're just going to use uh, a couple more examples to review the concepts of the electric potential. Okay. And what we did last time was like we said that the potential that we are talking in electricity, it has the same root as the one in gravitational potential. So everything that you have done before, actually you can sort of like do something analogous to electricity. So it's kind of nice, okay? And we can classify the way that the questions or problems that you have to solve, sort of like I can classify them into two types. One is the one that you have already given the field, right? Remember the E? You might have already had the E like this. You might have already given some electric fields. And now we understood this one by saying that if you go against the field, you're going in the direction that's moving toward the higher potential. Yeah, high, oh, oh, oh sorry. Yeah, high potential, yeah? And when I say higher potential, it's the same thing as I'm saying about high, higher potential energy. Because now we understood from last time that potential was just defined as the energy per unit charge. So U energy and the V potential are going in the same direction, okay? And on the other hand, if you go in the direction of the field, so it means you're going to, I mean, sorry, going along the field, you are going in the direction that's go toward the lower potential, right? When I say higher and lower, we're always talking about positive charge. Of course, if you talk about negatively charged particles, then everything will be reversed, all right? But anyway, we're just going to start our discussion from uh, regular positive charge. And whenever you hit with the negatively charged particle, everything will be flipped. Okay, cool. All right. So that was the first classification saying that you had to somehow uh, find out what is going on with the potential from the knowledge of the field. You are given the field. Another type of question would be if you have arrangements of point charges, yeah, like you have Q here, Q there, Q here, and on and on. And then you would like to figure out the potential from those charges. So you have the, the formula that you can use for that. Actually, this formula was just derived from the fields generated by those charges. Okay, but we just sort of like summarize into a, like a compact formula that you can use right away. So this is sort of like a ready to use thing. Okay, so what you got from a charge Q at a distance or from it is the potential is going to be equal to constant K times the Q divided by R, and that's it. Okay, that's kind of done. Good thing about this potential or potential energy is they are scalar quantities. So that means you don't have to worry about direction anymore, but the only thing that you need to worry about is the sign. So you make sure that you also include either positive or negative charge in this formula because there is a possibility of you getting negative potential, just like you digging a hole. So the empty edge could be higher than the reference point, or you can go lower than the reference point. So your empty edge back in the day of the gravitational potential can be either positive, zero, or negative. Same thing happens here. Okay, potential can be positive, zero, or negative. That's fine. And every time that you use this formula, we always keep in mind that we take potential to be zero at infinity. So this is the kind of thing that's just like you picked your reference point, let's say, and do a reference instead of having like a, you know, some height, there's no height here. So you take the potential to be zero at so far away. So you don't get any influence from those charge at all when it's so far away. So you say, okay, if you don't feel anything from that charge, then the potential from that charge should be zero. And by having that set up like this, the formula KQ over R is legit and you can use it. That's it. Okay. So those are the two things that you supposed to, I think, sort of like maybe that will help a little bit in terms of like, hey, which, which way that we can get to the potential or potential difference. So I classify them into two types. So either from the fields or either from the charge arrangement. Cool. All right. So that's just a quick review there. So let's take a look at one example. I think that will help a lot in terms of how to calculate the electric potential. So this one, once you just glance your eyes into this problem, it's just very easily seen that uh, uh, you can, it can be seen very easily that it's just 
and distribution of point charges. So in your head, it's just like, okay, I'm gonna aim for the K KQ over R for sure. The figure shows a rectangular array of charged particles fixed in place. The distance A is given to be 50 centimeter. The charges shown are integer multiple of Q1 or Q2. So the Q1 and Q2 value are also given. So that's fine. So with the V equal to zero at infinity. So once you see this line over here, that means that's your ticket to use the formula V equal to KQ over R. Sounds good. All right. So this one is nice. So what is the net? electric potential at the rectangle center. Oh, it's kind of quiet. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Wait a second. I just want to make sure that I get all the things set up. Yeah, microphone is here. Everything is good. Yeah. It's the, the sound is fine. Maybe just be. <laughs> so everybody else hearing me fine. I haven't changed any setup. <laughs> Maybe just you. <laughs> All right, <laughs> he gave you some sound effect there. All right, okay, so what you have here is uh, six charges, okay? And you would like to find the net electric potential at the center of this rectangle. So that's where this place, okay, let me mark that spot there. That's where you wanna get to. So let me sort of like draw you know, halfway between the length and the width, there you go. All right, so this is at the center. We can call this point P, for example. Now we would like to find the net potential at point P. So this problem is just exactly the one that we did last one. I mean, the last problem that we did last time. Same thing, right? We just redo it again. Okay, so now we have some experience already. So you can just sort of like go through one by one. Start from this positive 2Q1 on the upper left corner. It will contribute a little bit of potential at point P. All right, and then you move on to the next one. For Q2, you get some contribution there. And then you move on to the negative Q3, on and on, right? But then we already sort of like learned from experience a little bit that, oh, Dan, those charges at the corners stays away. I mean, stay at the distance A. It's diagonal. Say. It's say, they, they are at the same distance from point P. So all those four charges at the corners are at the same distance from point P. So why don't we just take these four and calculate them first? So I'm going to just take the potential from those four charges at the corner included here. So let's do that first. So the net potential at P, so let me say it's like sigma V at P. So you actually, you don't need the, the sigma, it's just V at P. It's going to be equal to, start from upper left corner, it's going to be K, the charge generating the field, I'm sorry, the generating the potential divided by the diagonal. So let me call that diagonal length to be just D for now. You can calculate D from Pythagorean theorem. That's no big deal. Okay. And then we move on to the one on the upper right corner. So plus K minus 3Q1 over D as well. Plus K. Now you can do lower left corner. Oh, might have some static. What? It's going on here. Okay, let me check. Um, hmm. Test, test. <laughs> Did I turn off the one here? Okay, okay. Here. Um, there's no sound connection here. Weird. I haven't done anything. Hmm. Okay, test, test, check, check again. Hello, hello. Um, is there any problem? Okay. Um, I don't know what to do, actually. Okay, let me reduce this one down. I hope that might help. Okay. Is it better? All right, let's hear me for a little bit while. So it's been like statics for the whole lecture. Is that it? Maybe not. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's keep on going for a while and just tell me again if it's still there, the static. Still there? Oh, 
Is that something around here? Me? Okay. For me, yes. <laughs> Not only you, it looks like. It seems like a couple of people having problem with the sound. Okay, that's bad. That's bad. Okay. All right, guys. You guys keep going. All right. Keep calculating this for me, please. All right. While I'm fixing it. So you have to include the one on the lower left, lower right. Once you're done with that, then you have to combine the last two. Okay. All right. And find me the net potential at point P. Cool. All right. What can I do? Okay, does this help? I don't know. Is that did it do anything? Nope, not here. All right, guys. So I've tried everything here. Okay, let me put some sound effects. Okay. Still there. <laughs> turn this one down, turn this one up a bit. Okay. Okay. Oh, maybe the connection. Okay. Sound very good. All right. Is that better? I hope. All right. Let's let's take this setting here. Okay. So the lower left corner, negative Q1. There you go. Negative Q1 over D, okay, and lower right corner, K over D. See, you have K over D for all those four charges at the corner. Very good. <laughs> okay, sound effect. All right, guys, plus, now you just have to add those two that I highlighted blue. So you have K positive 4Q2 that's on the top divided by, now you only need this distance over there, which is just A over two. Does that make sense? All right, just half this distance is A over two, plus K plus four Q over uh, Q2 divided by, also, this is also A over two. So that's A over two, that's it. So this is just the summation of all contributions from the, the six particles. However, the good thing is when we look at the green, I mean the, the green ink there, those from the four corners, there is plus two Q1, minus three, minus one, plus two. Right? Same thing. Actually, you can pull out the common factor K over D, and then you just take all those charges and sum all together. So actually, when you look, just sort of like, okay, look through this one more time. Wait, 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 wait. Plus two Q1, minus three, plus two. Actually, the sum of those four charges are zero. So that's a good thing is these are all canceled. So the net contribution from the four charges at the corner give you zero net potential at point P. So that's why at the end, you only have just only these two terms left. Okay, and these are a positive number. So that's great. So it's gonna be 16 KQ2 over A, and that's it, you done. Okay. Now okay. right, you can add in the number. Everything and then sort of like uh, you can substitute the numbers and everything to at the end of the calculation, and that should be very straightforward. Cool. All right. So is the sound is like back to normal? No static. Maybe. <laughs> Actually, I haven't done much. <laughs> Just like turn this down, that knob down a little bit. I don't know what to change. Okay. All right. Cool. Nice. Okay, so this is sort of like, I think this is very straightforward to calculate at any point in time. So let's do one more. I think everyone should be able to execute this problem very straightforwardly, even though you don't have the X or Y or anything anymore. It's just like free floating charge distribution. The question is finding out what is the potential at point P again. Okay. Oh, okay. There's a question comes in about the dimension. Okay. Um, I think it's right here. So they said that the length of this side over here is A. This is also A. So that's why I know that the distance 
over here is supposed to be half of the A. So that's why I know it's A over two. Does that make sense? Yeah, because it's midway. Point P is at the midpoint, either from the length or from the height. So that's why I know it's supposed to be A over two. Okay, cool. Alrighty. Nice. Okay, guys, find out what is the potential at point P. And then you can see that you see this word again. Take V to be zero at infinity. So this is a ticket for you to start like, okay, John, I can use this formula KQ over R. Okay. And once again, you kind of like used to this kind of stuff. So I can name each one. Let me call it like uh, this to be charge number one, number two, number three, and number four. So what you can see right away is charge number one, number two, and number three are at the distance D away from point P. So they're sharing the same distance from point P. So first thing first, you can say, okay, potential at P is going to be V1 plus V2 plus V3 plus V4. Cool. Okay. But then you can see that the first three are sharing the same distance, same distance, same distance. So you know it's going to be K over A, I'm sorry, K over D. And then the sum of these three charges, right? It's KQ over A, KQ over A, KQ over A. You pull out the K over A. So you have positive Q from number one, minus Q from number two, and plus Q from number three. So that's it. That's a contribution from first three. And now just add the fourth one. The distance from the charge number four to point P is 2D. So it's going to be K minus Q. That's the charge number four divided by 2D. All right, nice. So what you have over here is you can cancel one out. So it's going to be KQ over D minus KQ over 2D. So at the end, it's going to be, it's still positive. KQ over 2D. And then you can substitute the numbers and everything, whatever you, whenever you like, and then you are done. Okay. Cool. So I hope by seeing these three examples over here, calculations of potential from point charge distributions seem to be all right. Now the problem would get elevated. <laughs> the difficulty would get a little bit at the next level. When you have this, guys, you want to give it a try? We already did some calculus-based problem with the electric fields, and we actually did calculate the potential, I'm sorry, the charge. I'm sorry, <laughs> I keep talking. We already did calculated the field from this ring of charge. Okay, so now the question turned into what about the potential? And we already learned how to figure out the field at point P. So now we would like to find out what about the potential at point P? You want to give it a try, guys? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. What do you think? All right? You're going to apply the same kind of calculus that you did before. Then just do the summation. But the summation will be sort of like continuous sum. So that was the integral. So you know you're going to have to do some integration for sure. But the first step that we took before was just like slice this charge into a tiny piece first. And inside that tiny piece of charge, it will contain the amount of charge, dq. Very, very mini, super, super freaking small dq right there. So the question is, how much is the potential generated by this tiny piece of charge, dq? But that's no problem. The potential is going to be K, the charge that generating the potential, divided by the distance. I can call this distance D, but from Pythagorean theorem, it's just square root of X squared plus A squared, where A is just the radius of the ring, and X is just the distance from the center of the ring to point P. So it's just X squared plus A squared. And because this charge is so tiny, the potential that you're getting from it is going to be a tiny one as well. So let me put D in the front. It's an infinitesimally small potential from infinitesimally small charge. <laughs> okay, then you're going to have to keep doing this. So you slice the next one, DQ, 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 DQ. Actually, you do it continuously. DQ, 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 DQ. And all of those DQ will give you 
the same contribution. So that means this equation actually will apply to all those DQ that you slice out from this ring. Does that make sense, guys? Cool. So that means all you need to do is just add those together using the same equation over here. So at the end, that's the V right there. That's the net potential at point P. Cool? Using the same expression here, K DQ over distance. Okay, cool. Now, do you need to do the integral? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, then, wait a second. This is the same type of problem that we saw before with the point charge distribution. All of the DQ that we got from this ring are at the same distance D from the ring to point P. You guys seeing that? Yeah, no matter where your DQs are, yeah, your DQ there, the distance from the DQ to point P is still the D, same thing. So it's the same concept, even though you don't have to think about it in this way, you can just look at the integral and then you say, well, John, I can see that K is constant. That square root x squared plus a squared is also constant. So I can pull out from the integral. And so it's the same thing. It's just like, okay, if you have charges lying at the same distance, the net potential is just k divided by the distance and then the sum of the charges. This is exactly the same thing. Well, hey, Dan, what is this? It's just the dq and then you add the whole dq together and they already give you that the total amount of charge on the ring is capital Q. So this is your capital Q. Does that make sense? You just take the DQ, 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 and sum them up. You're going to get back the charge of the whole ring. And that's it, guys. The answer for this one is KQ over X squared plus A squared. And you are done. Okay. So not too bad. Okay. The good thing about potential, once again, it is just a scalar quantity. So you don't have to worry about the components of the electric field. What we did before was, even though the calculator was bad, but then you have to just break electric field into components, horizontal and perpendicular, and then the vertical components cancel each other out. You only left with just the electric field along the axis of the ring, something like that. That was the field. That was the vector quantities. But now, you only have the potential, which is just a scalar quantities. So it's just an algebraic summation. Cool. All right. So there's a question comes in. Can we use the formula for the electric potential of the continuous distribution of charge? Can we use the formula for electric potential? Yeah, we actually, I did. I did use that. See this? Okay, let me highlight this one for you. Yeah, I did use that. K, Q over R. It's the same. I'm actually using it right here. So let me mark on the side here. That's K, Q over R. It's in effect right there. Oh, the one over four. Okay. All right, guys. So just one more time. This K right here. Okay, I got it. Is the same as one over four pi epsilon naught. See? Okay. So I told you that you have two ways of writing out this Coulomb's constant K. You can write it just like K, or you can write it as one over four pi epsilon naught. That epsilon naught will show up later, but these two are exactly the same. And one thing is they are just constants anyway. So it's your choice. You can write it as one over four pi epsilon naught as well. Yeah, but just for us at this point, K seems to be easier to write. That's all. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. Alrighty. All right. Thank you for that. Yeah, because I think maybe some of you got confused about the constant. But I done why some pages in your slides like one over four pi epsilon naught. Some slides k. Just want to confirm with you guys again that these two quantities or these two constants are the same. Yeah. All right, guys. So if this is good, can you do this? Come on, man. <laughs> it's a stat static gone. Is that the sound? Everything seems to be back to normal. I hope. Yeah. Or you have to sort of like bear with it at this point. Okay. All right. No response seems to be good. <laughs> 
All right, guys, calculate this one for me. Let's see if you can execute this one. If you can, you are in good shape. So this is almost at the level of the question in the exam. All right, so it's not going to be harder than this. I don't think if you can get this one down, then I think you have enough understanding and enough like foundations that showcase your understanding in potential already. So, all right, in the figure, let us read through the problem together first. In the figure, a plastic rod having a uniformly distributed charge given the capital Q, okay, that's fine. Pico is 10 to the negative 12, okay, fine. Now, it has been bent into a circular arc of radius R, given as well, four centimeter. The central angle is also given, all right, it's supposed to be phi, guys, sorry, maybe it's, yeah, the figure is in phi, so let's change that to phi. The phi is 120 degree. Take V to be zero at infinity, that's good. So whenever you see this, that you think of KQ over R, that is allowed. What is the electric potential at P, the center of curvature of the rock? You wanna give it a shot? All right, we found out the electric field at point P before, right? And remember we did calculus, we'd have to break into two components, horizontal, vertical, blah, blah, blah. And then you really did do the calculus thing. You have to integrate. What about this one? If some of you can spot this right away, I mean, you're in good shape. <laughs> All right, but anyway, we can start from the fundamental thing, right? S following the same process there. You can slice out a tiny piece of charge and that will contain a tiny piece of charge dq on that rod that tiny piece of charge will generate potential at p to be equal to let me call v to be mini v because charge is going to be mini there k times the q which is dq divided by the distance the distance is going to be the radius of the arc cool nice and of course, what you have to do is you have to slice from the top or from the bottom, either way. And then you do the DQ, 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 all the way down here. All right. And each DQ that you get from there, you're going to get the contribution of the potential at point P. Cool. So that means this expression works for any DQ that you slice out from this rod. It still looks like KDQ over R anyway. So that means the net potential at point P is just a sum of all these stuff, all these contribution. So at the end, you're going to get the net potential at point P this way. But as I said, some of you has already spotted it, I think. But then all those DQ that you slice out, they are at the same distance from point P, which is just the R, the radius of this arc. Or looking at the expression from the integral over here, you, it's the same thing as you pull out the k, the constant. The r is also constant. So what you have left is just the integral of the dq. But this has nothing to do in terms of the integration because this is just the net, potent, um, net charge on this rod. So that's it, guys. The answer is k, capital Q over r, and you are done. Okay. Cool. <laughs> See, it's easier than you think, I hope. This is like, okay, well done. This is sort of like way easier than find out the electric field at point P. Okay, and then you can substitute the numbers and everything, calculating the numerical values from this. Cool. All right, so if this is good, guys, come on. Oh, okay, that's a question coming in. Do we need integrate over 120 degree? See, that's a good question. Do you still need that 120 degree? The answer is not anymore. I don't care. Because whatever you have, whatever angle you have at the center of the arc, your net charge is the most important stuff that you want. And the net charge is just Q. So the degree doesn't really matter. Think another way. If I squeeze this arc or this, this plastic rod into like, if I bend it and it's sort of like I squeeze it down into like maybe 60 degree, 
I still get the same potential anyway. You guys with me? It's still KQ over R. So the angle phi has no change or has no effect on the net potential at point P. Very good. I can even spread this rod around even further. I can sort of like, you know, think of it like a, like a clay. <laughs> Keep it in the or whatever. Like, and then you can just sort of, sort of like, you know, just sort of like stretch it out, make it thinner, but the, the arc go a little bit longer. It doesn't matter because all those charges are still at the same distance from point P. So what you want is just a net amount of charge. Cool. All right. But that's a great question there. Yeah. I forgot to mention about that, that phi equal to 120 has no results. It has no effect on the final answer of this one. Very nice. Cool. All right. So if this is good, guys, this is a test. This is actually a question in the exam, the old exam. I used this one as an exam before, but probably I'm not going to use it anymore <laughs> because we use it as an example already. So in the figure, you have three thin plastic rods form quarter circles with a common center of curvature at the origin. Nice. Now you start to see what that, this is not going to be difficult anymore. The uniform charges on the rods are given Q1, Q2, and Q3. What is the net electric potential at the origin due to the rod? Even though this one, they don't have like take potential to be zero at infinity, but we don't have any other choices, right? <laughs> this is the only formula we have. So we still assume the potential is zero at infinity. Okay, guys. So now you already saw the, the calculation from this uh, problem. You start to see, that, oh, okay, the key techniques to use in this one is just you only care about the net charge and the distance from the charge to point of calculation. So over here, you can say, well, hey, Tan, that Q1 distributed along this first arc here, they are at the same radius, one centimeter here. So, oh, okay. So actually, the net potential at the origin is going to be V from the first arc, V from the second arc, and V from the third arc. Does that make sense? All right. So um, to make it kind of nice, and make sure that you can see clearly what it is. So let me put color here. So let's take the first one there. That's the green. Okay. And then you follow by the blue right there. And then you follow by the red right there. Is that cool? Let me call that V1, V2, and V3. And look at the first one first. The V1, more than the distance from all those charges on the first arc to the origin is just going to be the radius of that first arc. And we already do this problem before. It's going to be K, the total amount of charge in the arc, and that will be Q1 divided by, let me put one centimeter right here, just to be clear here. Yeah, one centimeter. Cool? Okay. Does that make sense? That's from the first contribution of the first arc. Now the next contribution comes from the second arc Q2. And we don't have to do anything anymore because it's just going to be K, the total charge on that arc Q2, divided by now the distance is going to be the radius of that second arc, and it's going to be 0 0.02 meter. And then plus the last one, the bigger one, but it's still K Q3, divided by the distance over here, and that's going to be four meter there. And that's it, guys. The rest is just you do the summation there. You can pull. I mean, you don't have to pull anything. You just substitute. Here you want to be positive. Don't forget the sign, though. Okay, nano coulomb. Nano is 10 to the negative 9 divided by, oh, I think I wrote this one wrong, guys. It's already in meter. Sorry. There you go. All right, so it's going to be 0 0.01 meter. And then you keep doing it, K, Q2 is still positive. So put three times the Q1, or actually, I suppose to substitute the number at the end, I think, <laughs> because this is going to be too many numbers here. So, okay, let me redo it one more time, guys, just to save some space here. Oh, whoa, whoa, I did it do way too much there. There you go. 
All right, so it's going to be equal to, there you go, equal to K, Q1, or 0 0.01. Let me omit the unit here. K, Q2 is 3, Q1, or 0 0.02, 0 0.02, plus K negative 8, Q1, over 0 0.4. That's it, guys. And then you just work out all those numbers and you are done. Okay. Cool. All right. Not too bad. Okay. So I think this is super, super straightforward now, I think, in your eyes. And I hope that the potential calculations problem should be very doable in comparison to electric field because electric field is sort of like, you know, complicated in the sense of like you have to deal with the vector quantities. Yeah? All right, very nice. Any questions, guys, so far? I don't know, it's kind of hot. I don't know, there's something wrong here. I'm like sweating right now, so. Okay, any questions? So far, so good. All right, guys, now, as like a closing stuff that we would like to do, I just want to bring everyone back to the full circle of things that we have done about the potential and potential energy. And I hope by sort of like exercising the last stuff over here, you will have like a firm foundation of <laughs> electric potential and electric potential energy in your head. All right, guys. So let me show you this. I think let me sort of like give you like an overview of what is about to happen here. And then we'll take a break first because otherwise it will drag a little bit too long. It would just, you know, it just, you know, would take like 10, 15 minutes over time uh, from the first half of the lecture. So let me talk about this. What I am about to show you sort of like closing down these topics over here is I'm going to bring you guys back to the potential energy. Okay. And just to revise everything one more time, if you want to get back and talk about the energy from the perspective of the potential, what would that be? Cool. You understand what I'm trying to get to? All right. We define potential from the potential energy. But now we seem to work under potential a lot because we have formulas, we have the calculus, we have everything V equal to KQ over R, blah, blah, blah. So it seems like we seem to work with the V first. And now if I'm asking you to do the backward calculation from the potential, how can you get back to the potential energy? Does that make sense, right? So everything will come in full circle here. So look at this. If VP is the potential due to the charge Q1 at point P, everyone is fine, well done. That's no problem. Okay. Then the work required to bring a second charge, now you have the second charge Q2, from infinity to point P is going to be how much? Okay, be careful here. The question asking you the work required. So that means now somebody else is doing the work. Like me, I am the one who's going to drag the Q2 charge from infinity. So the Q2 is somewhere here so far away. I'm going to drag it and place it there. How much energy do we have to do? How much work that I have to do? How much energy do I have to supply to the Q2 to drag Q2 from so far away and put it at point P? That is the question that I'm going to answer. Okay, guys? Sounds like a good question to sort of like, leave you with this question during the break. And then after the break, I will answer this question. So if you guys would like to think about this during the break, that would be nice. All right. But if not, that's okay. I will let you know what's the answer to this problems here. All right, guys. So I think this is a good place to stop and take a break right here. Sounds good. Okay. All okay. right. Guys. Okay. So what I would like you to imagine some, it goes something like this. So think about it because we're going to think in the same line as the potential in gravity, right? So I have charge so far away. I want to drag that charge to point P. So I want to know 
what is the potential at point P? Why? Because the potential in your head is like potential energy. It gives you the elevation. Does that make sense? The height. <laughs> Give you the height. So think of it this way. If this is the Q1 that is generating the potential around, think of it that way. Okay. And because we know around this charge is going to be KQ1 over R. Are you guys with me? Okay, KQ1 over R. That's a formula that you use to calculate the potential at the distance R away from the Q1. So that means at the distance R12, at point P, you're going to have the potential here to be 1, okay, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. That's okay. The Q1 over R12. Check. You guys with me? Okay. Now, because this potential, let's say if everything's Right now, they're all positive, all right? Don't, don't think about negative at this point. Let's assume that right now they're all positive. So that means the potential at point P is positive at the moment. What does it mean by you have positive potential? It means you are going uphill. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, potential high. High potential means like you look up like over the mountain or something like that. You want to walk up the mountain. So... You want to drag Q2 uphill from zero. Over here, you have zero potential. You want to drag from zero to this level right here at VP. See? So what is the amount of energy that you need to bring the charge from infinity to point P? Well, first, you need to figure out the potential difference. Potential difference is final minus initial all the time, right? That's what we always keep saying. Delta change is always final minus initial. So the final is at point P. The initial is at infinity, so far away, which you know this one goes to zero. So that means the potential difference from point P and infinity is that V at P. Oh, oh nice. Now, we already said, if you want the energy, what do you do? You multiply by the charge that going through that potential difference. So the, port, the <laughs> energy that you need, which is going to be the work done by me, by external agent, whoever, could be somebody else, could be some engine, some machine, somebody, me pooling, is going to be the charge that you want to drag through those potential difference, multiply by the potential difference itself. Does that make sense, guys? And that's it. It's going to be Q2 times V at P, and that is going to be Q2 times K, Q1 over R12. And that's the end of the line here is just K, Q1, Q2 over R12, and you are done. Okay. Does that make sense here? So that's why I'm sort of like trying to talk to you about thinking uh, about the, the relationship between the potential and potential energy. They are pretty much the same. And knowing the potential allow you to calculate the potential energy. And this one is sort of like comparing this to bringing some mass from the ground level uphill, for example, everyone knows to bring something higher, you have to supply energy to it. Same thing over here. You started out from zero. You start from here. You want to end up here, which is higher in potential. So that means you, you mean us, we have to drag this Q2 charge from the ground, which is at zero, uphill to this point. How much energy do you need? Take the charge, multiply by the potential difference, which you already calculated to be just the potential at that point. Does that make sense? Okay, so if not, I will have another example for you. So it will be a little bit clearer. But my point over here is the work that we are talking about right here is the work by external force. Which, that's why there's no negative sign here. 
Remember when we defined the potential from the field, we have to put the negative sign there because when we talk about the field and the force due to that field is the work done by the field itself. Does that make sense? But now the question asking you about the work required. So that means you want to know how much work from somebody else, not by the field, somebody else has to supply to the charge to drag the charge from one point to, to another point. Okay, so that's why there's no negative sign here. And everything look exactly just like the conservation of energy that you had before. The work done by the external force equal to the change of the total energy of the system. Perfect. Okay. Okay, one more time. All right. If you're still sort of confused a little bit, let me give you another example over here. Here we go, guys. Try again. Find the work done in bringing the full microcoulomb charge from so far away to point P. Point P is up here. So now you know about what time I want to drag the charge full microcoulomb from so far away, which we kind of know that potential there is zero. I would like to drag this charge and place it there at point P. What do you do? What do you need to do is just find out what is the potential at P. If the potential at P is positive, it means you're going uphill because potential at P is higher than the zero. If the potential at P is negative, so it means you're going downhill. Does that make sense? So the work that could be positive or negative depends on the endpoints, the V at P is at the higher elevation or lower elevation than zero. Okay, cool. All right, so let me work on this one. Now you guys know how to calculate potential at a point. So this is sort of like an easy task now. Potential at point P come from two contribution, one from five microcoulomb, another one from negative two microcoulomb. Does that make sense? Okay, start from the first is going to be the K, the five microcoulomb here, <laughs> follow my, here. it's already written in this slide here, divided by the distance from my five microcoulomb to point P is four meter. That's it. That's the KQ over R from the five microcoulomb charge. Plus the second one is going to be K negative two microcoulomb, T negative two microcoulomb divided by the distance from negative two microcoulomb to point P, it's five meter. So I put five meter here. I just add them together. So the net, as you can see, you still have the net positive. Oh, that's nice. What does it mean by net positive? It means the potential at point P is higher than zero. So to bring in the charge for microcoulomb and place it there, you're dragging the charge uphill. This is a positive charge, guys. It's uphill. So the amount of work done is just going to be the charge multiplied by the potential difference. So now in your head, you know it's a VP minus V infinity. Cool? Okay, no problem. Okay. So you take the four microcoulomb charge multiplied by V at P. You're done. See, the net work done is also positive. So it means I, you, or whoever external force has to do positive work to take the charge uphill to point P and you are okay. okay. Well, then we might ask him, Ajahn, what about if I would like to bring in the negatively charged particle somehow? If the charge that you want to bring in is negatively charged. So the sign will flip over. Everything will turn into negative. You guys with me? Because the negative charge will behave opposite to the positive charge. So it, by nature, the negatively charged particle will always go uphill by itself. <laughs> Does that make sense? So like this one is maybe counterintuitive because we don't, we don't have that with the mass. The mass always roll downhill by itself, right? Not roll uphill. If you want to go uphill, you have to drag the mass up. But now because in electricity, you have two types of charge, positive or negative. So if you would like to bring the positive charge uphill, you have to supply the work to the charge. However, if you're trying to drag the negatively charged uphill, you don't have to do the work. It turns out 
that negatively charged would love to go uphill by itself. You somehow have to hold them back. Does that make sense? So think of it like walking a dog or something like that. The dog try to go forward. You want to hey hey hey, don't go too far. You have to pull the dog backward. You are doing a negative work. Cool. So that means from the perspective of the negatively charged uphill is like you going downhill. In the case of the mass, I don't know. Am I making sense or not? Okay. So the mass try to roll downhill. So if you try to bring the mass downhill, you are doing the negative work because it's gonna go downhill by itself. You have to walk in the dog. You have to pull the mass backward while the mass is going downhill. So that's why the work done is negative. But now switch back to electricity. If you have a negatively charged particle, the negative charge love to go uphill by itself. So if in this particular example here you want to bring the negative charge from infinity to point P, of course everything will flip. Your work done will be negative because that negative charge wants to go to point P by itself. You have to somehow drag it backward. Okay, it's like walking the dog there. All okay. right, I don't know. Am I making any okay. sense to you or not? <laughs> If not, that's okay. <laughs> okay. I will have one example to finalize and sort of like seal the deal over here, and then hope you understand what it means. Here we go, guys. Try this problem. So if you know how to solve these problems, I think you understand what we are trying to do at this point: the relationship between the potential and the potential energy, and eventually the work done during that movement. Okay. So in the rectangle of the figure. The sides having the length five centimeter, the 15, uh, uh, five and 15 centimeter. Okay, Q1 is given, Q2 is given. Let's V to be zero at infinity. That's fine. So that's your ticket to use V equal to KQ over R everywhere you like. What is the electric potential at corner A and B? Okay, let's figure out these two first question first. What is the potential at the corner A? Yeah, so let me pull this one corner A right there. V at A is equal to. You have only two charges here, right? So let's do K Q one over. All right, let me put the dimension here right away, so it's clear. So this is 15 centimeter. So let me put 0.15 there, and the height here is 0.05. That's five centimeter. So the potential at A is going to be K. Q1 divided by the distance of that 0.15 plus k. Now you do the Q2 down here, and it's going to be just 0.05 distance. Cool. Now substitute the sign and everything into it just to make sure you get it right. K Q1 is negative, so we have to put negative five micro coulomb. Let me omit the unit here. Everything is in SI. There you go. That's the first term there. Plus K Q2 is positive, so it's a two micro coulomb. Micro is 10 to the negative t. 3.05. Is that nice? Okay. Okay. Now because I want this to be very clear, I'm gonna have to work out these numbers just a little bit. I like. This one to be as close as the final form as possible. So k is still k. That is fine. Okay. I have to say this is three minus five is one. So it's going to be 10 to the negative three over 0.15. There you go. That is the potential at point A. Cool. Okay. I hope my number is correct. <laughs> Now next. Figure out what is the potential at point B, guys. Same thing, all right? You're gonna have the contribution from the Q1, so it's gonna be K Q1. Now the distance is 0.05. Cool. Plus K, the contribution from Q2, and the distance is now 0.15. No problem. Okay. Substituting the numbers, don't forget the sign. K Q1 is negative. All right, divided by 0.05 plus Q2. Q2 is positive, so that's fine. 
There you go. So far, so good. All right. I want another number just to make the comparison very obvious. K is K. So I do the same thing, multiply by three. Okay. So I have negative 15 plus two, negative 13 times 10 to the negative three divided by 0.15. There you go. That is my potential at B. Cool. So finding out the potential at A and at B are not bad. Okay. Okay. okay this two is fine. Now, the de decisive moment is here. What about the question C, guys? How much work is required to move a charge Q3? Now you have the third charge, three microcoulomb from B to A along the diagonal of the rectangle. There you go. I want to drag the third charge. I have Q3. I want to start from B drag it diagonally to A, how much energy is required. Go ahead. No need, no need. Okay, guys, what do you think? Martin, do just like what you did. The work done okay, by the external force is going to be the change in the energy. Yeah, that's no big deal, right? Let me emphasize this is external because if it's work by the system, you must have a negative sign, yeah? All right, equal to Q3, you got it with me now? The charge that you wanna drag and multiply by the potential difference. Whoa, no problem, yeah? Wow. And then, because you wanna, it's a delta, the delta is the final minus initial all the time. Okay, we agree with that. Now your final is at A, you have to put VA there, Initial is at B, you have to put B later. All right, and because now you already calculated the final results, I mean the numbers for each one of them. So all you need to do is just take the VA, plug it in here, take the VB, plug it in there. But now you can see from the results. You guys can see that VA is positive. VB is negative. So what does it mean? It means that at location B, this is low, right? And at A, that is high. So going from B to A, you are going uphill, uphill. So that's why whatever you get from this number, you're going to get a positive number because you, to go uphill, you need some energy supplied to the charge Q3. Cool? Mm-hmm. Mm hmm all right. And actually, I don't care. You want to go in the diagonal or not. You can go as crazy as you like. You can go, woo, woo, boo, boo, I don't care. Because what you need is just the initial point and the final point. The path independence is always built in in the topics of electricity. So the diagonal or not, you still get the same amount of work done bringing the charge from B to A. It's going to be equal to the charge that you want to bring multiplied by the potential difference, and you are done. Okay. Yeah, we have a big conclusion here, guys. <laughs> All right. Nice. Okay. Now, to make things very complete and feel like we are doing college physics right now, <laughs> So I would like to love, uh, I would love to do the next stuff. I don't know you like this or not, but I would like to bring back the vector calculus one more time. All right, you guys love it, I hope. No. <laughs> Here, look at this slide and how do you feel? <laughs> it's like, John, okay, what are you doing here? Okay, so we have already done integral calculus <clears throat> with the vector quantity, all right? That is a part of, vector calculus there. But we haven't done differential of some vector quantity yet. So this is the kind of thing that you have to deal with in vector calculus. However, to introduce to you this operation over here, it would, you know, some of you might just like, okay, I don't want to deal with this. I haven't taken any vector calculus course. I mean, it's supposed to be like calculus two or calculus three or something like that. So I haven't done that. And then you want to do this. Okay, I know it's too much for you to take here because it seems like at the end, it's very simple. So 
to have you go through this kind of like huge barrier is going to be like a waste of time at this point, right? It seems like the time is not right. So what I'm going to show you is this, and let's see if you agree with me. All right, so I'm going to add a page. And let's see if you kind of like can see this con uh, the relationship. Okay, let me ask you this. You guys familiar with this already? Potential from the gravity is mgh. But then instead of talking about h, we just want to put some coordinates into it. Because when you have a mass right here and you have a mass at the top, you can put it on the y-axis if you like. You guys with me? Okay. All right. And then you can say this is a level. This is the ground level that you call height equal to zero on and on. So I can say the potential energy is going to be in the form of the coordinate y, m, g, y. Okay. You guys okay with this? Not a problem. Another example over here is mass with a spring right there. Well, then this is right not too bad if i stretch the spring out to a distance x away from the equilibrium points what you get from this is like oh yeah i still remember the spring potential energy is one half kx squared all right we saw this from oscillations right which you're going to take some exams this friday yeah <laughs> i'm not friday sorry saturday saturday <laughs> okay but anyway that's not the point the point is you guys try this. Can you do the derivative for me? Let's do du by dy. What do you get? Well, oh, done. That's easy. That's mj. Same thing. Going to apply to the spring. Can you do du by dx for me? Well, done. That's fine. That's kx. How do you feel about this? <laughs> How do you feel? What do you see? Is there anything that you can notice here? Hmm. Mg and kx. Oh, okay, then mg is this. It's the weight, the mass times the gravitational acceleration. It's a force pulling this mass down. And kx is the same thing. Actually, it's kx is a spring force. But one thing that is missing is the direction because mg is the force. Kx is also the force. What you get over here is just like, it's a function. You just differentiate a function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a direction. Well, hey, 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 mg is pointing down. So actually, it's the negative j hat. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. J is unit vector pointing up. Oh, that's not bad. With the kx, it's the same thing. Kx is actually pointing in the negative x direction. So the i hat is pointing to your right. So it's a negative i hat. You feel something here? <laughs> so what I'm trying to say over here is, whenever you are given a form of a potential energy function, you are able to figure out the force that underlying that potential energy. Isn't that okay. cool? Yeah, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> so that means every time that you are given a functional form, a function form of potential energy, you can take that form, differentiate with respect to the coordinates in that, in that function, slap in the negative sign, take it, the, uh, bring it, the unit vector along that coordinates, and you get the force that is behind that potential energy, believe it or not. Is it a nice? Cool. Okay, so that's what it means. Now, I'm gonna show you this. If I give you some function of potential, and this is going to be your electric, can you find me the electric force from this? How would you do it? Well done. I know, I know, I can do it. What you need to do is just you take the derivative of that with respect to the coordinates. It could be x, it could be y, it could be z. But if you do it along with the x, slap in the negative side, bam, put the vector in that direction, I had, because you take derivative with respect to x, that is going to be your force 
vector. Cool? Wow. Okay. However, the problem is this. What you get over here is because you take the derivative with respect to x. What you get is only the x component of this there. But that it works because you just, whatever you differentiate with respect to, you're going to get the vector in that direction after slapping the negative sign in the front. Cool? So that means you should be able to do this along the y and along the z axis as well to give you the force along the x, force along the y, force along the z. Now, we already defined the electric fields and electric potential. Okay, final step, guys. I can express this force in terms of the charge multiplied by the field. So it's going to be field in that same direction, right? And we already defined the energy to be the charge multiplied by the potential. <laughs> that we don't need to put the subscript E there anymore. So that means the charge there can be canceled. Bam, bam then you can turn this expression into the expression for negative dv by dx. It will give you the electric field along the x-axis, and you are done. Okay. Isn't that cool, guys? Does that make sense? <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is this. If you are given a potential function. By taking the derivative with respect to the coordinates, you will get to the electric field pointing in that direction after a slap in the negative sign. That's it. You are done, guys. Okay. Okay. Got that one? And here's the conclusion right there. See? Isn't that nice? So without... Uh, for those of you that want to dig in into like, you know, how to derive this on and on, you can read through this, but that's what it is. You are given a potential function V. You take the derivative with respect to X, you will get the X component of the electric fields. However, the actual potential could be a multivariate function. It doesn't have to be X alone, Y alone, Z alone. It could be X, Y, or Z in combinations. So now your derivative is not going to be a single dimension derivatives anymore. So that's why we need the partial derivatives, guys. Welcome okay. to the world of the particulars here. So as you can see, I need to use that curly D over here just to say that my differentiation is only with respect to X. I don't care about the Y. I don't care about the Z. Once I'm done with that, slap in the negative side, bam, I get the X component of the electric field. If I want to calculate the Y component of the electric field, no problem. Start with the V, taking the derivative with respect to Y, slap in the negative side, bam, I get the Y component of that electric field. If I want a Z component of the electric field, take that potential, take the derivative with respect to Z alone, slap in the negative sign, I get the Z component. Oh, that's a typo here. Z component of the electric field, and you are done. Okay. That's how simple it is, guys. Seriously. So I love this one in the sense that even though you don't understand the vector calculus behind this, the recipe is super simple, All right? Even though you don't understand this topic whatsoever, the only thing that you know is this formula will take you to the electric field calculation from the potential function. So I will show you how easy it is to execute this one, guys. Look at this example here, see? So say, hey, calculate the electric field from electric potential that's described by the following function. That's nice. So we say, okay, John, I have the potential function in front of me. I will be able to calculate electric field in all direction. If you want the X component of this, take the derivative of that V with respect to X alone, slap in the negative sign, I'm done. <laughs> see? Okay. Is it that easy? You don't, I mean, even though I don't understand what is it in terms of geometry of this or the calculus behind this, I know this is how I'm going to get to the electric field along the x direction. Okay, let's give it a shot, guys. Negative signs in the front. dv by dx, partially, it means you treat y and z to be just numbers. That's not a function anymore. It's only a function of x from the perspective of partial derivative here. So the first term will give you 2xy. You guys with me? y is just a number. Plus 0, because you have y cubed, 
is just a number, derivative of number is equal to zero plus z. That's it, guys. It's done. Okay. That's the electric field along the x. Keep going. If you want the electric field along the y component, you do dv by dy, slap in the negative sign, you're done. So let's go this, go through this one together, guys. Derivative of this with respect to y give you x squared. See, dy by dy is one, plus three y squared, plus there's no y in it in the third term, zero. Cool. Last one, the z component of this, it's going to be dv by dz, slab in the negative sign. Negative sign is there. dv by dz for the first term is nothing. There's no z in it. Second term, nothing. There's no z in it. And the last one is going to give you x. That's it. These are three components of the electric field. So if you want the vector format for this electric field, okay, it's just going to be ex along the i, ey along the j, plus EZ along the K. And that is the vector okay. form of the electric field at any point. When I say at any point, what does it mean? Well, guys, can you give me the electric field at one, one, one? What do you do? You just substitute one, one, one into X, Y, and Z. So you just plug in the X, Y, Z into those three expression, what you're going to get is going to be, okay, negative uh, 3i plus minus 1, 1, no, that's 4, minus 4j and minus 1k. There you go. You're done. Okay. But you guys, yeah, and then you just substitute the numbers into it and then you just have the vector of the electric field at one, one, one. And if you want to find the magnitude of the electric field, that's no big deal. So the magnitude is going to be just the Pythagorean theorem. It's going to be three square. We have you put negative three square, negative four square, negative one square, and the square root. Isn't that easy? All right, guys. So I think you got the way that you can get to the electric field from the potential function very easily. That's no big deal, right? So the final point that I want to make here is this. What kind of relationship that you can actually relate to this operation here? Well, it sounds like, Adan, what are you doing over here? It's just like, okay, I can memorize it. I know that if you want this, I just do the partial derivative slap in the negative sign. I'm done. But if you look carefully, what kind of operation is this? Guys, can you see this? See this? Potential energy on the left. Everyone knows that this is the ground level. This is at some height. This is at some height. This is at some height. Yeah? <laughs> See that? So the gravity, G, cut through this height perpendicularly. You guys with me? Wow. Okay, one more time. G, you don't even have to take the M along with you. G, the gravity, is actually pointing downward. Why? Because it cut through the layer of the potential energy, or in this case, potential, perpendicularly down. Look on the right for the spring. It depends on the X. So at one value of X, you get one value of the potential. You move on to the next x, you get another 1k x squared, different value. So it means you can slice the x into layers and you can see what is the kx is pointing to. The kx, which is just the force, is pointing perpendicular to this. Does this give you a clue in any way? Almost there, almost there. All right, so if you don't see this, let me give you this example here. I have to add one more page. And I hope this will give you the aha moment here. <laughs> Guys, if I draw this, what do you see?
Oh, that's not nice. Yeah, let's do this. There you go. Maybe I don't need that last one. <laughs> what do you see, guys? Oh, Dan, it's kind of like it looks familiar. This one is the contour map. Does it give you any idea here? The thing is, I need the contour map because of this. Back in here, when we look at the function, right? When you talk about the function f of x, you need two axes. One is for x, the other one for the value of the function, right? So if you have f of x, y, then now you need three dimension, right? So x, y, and the z axis will be used to plot the function out. But then now we have like three variable function f, x, y, z. What do you do? I mean, it's still quite doable. You don't need like hyper dimension or anything, but you can use like maybe the intensity of a point to give you the value of the function. It's still quite doable, all right? But anyway, this thing is kind of clear if you look at just the two variable function, f of x, y. So f, x, y, it will give you a surface. It will be a surface, like maybe the mountain surface over here, something like that. Does that make sense? Okay, so the function itself in the two-dimensional case is easy to imagine. The function of x, y will give you a surface. And now, if I cut the surface of this one perpendicularly, that will give me the slice of this mountain. So I cut bam, one layer, one layer there, one layer there, one layer there, one layer there. That's what my slice is. I'm slicing through horizontally. And if I look downward from the top, I see the contour map here. Make sense? So what you can say about Ajahn, I can say, okay, this is at zero level. That's maybe 100 meter, 200 meter, 300 meter, 400 meter, 500, on and on. So you have the height, the elevation there. So over here, I can say, okay, here, guys, this is my peak, 600 right here, 500 there. Four or five thousand, five hundred there, four hundred here, three hundred there, two hundred on and on. That's down to the floor. Okay, All right. So that's what it means by contour map. It pre trying to give you a perspective of the three D surface, but plot on just a two D map. So that's why you have to label each line the height. Okay, cool. So everyone is okay, sort of like familiar with this contour map, right? Now, if I have a starting point up here, guys, let me standing here. Woohoo! And let me go downhill. I want to walk downhill, but I want to go in the quickest way possible. Do you think which direction should I move? I want to go down. I want to jump down from this mountain over here. Well, not jump. I mean, I just want to run down the hill in the direction that's give me the quickest path. So you guys know about that. You have to cut through this one perpendicularly. Just go there, Dan. Dan, go there. That's the quickest path that you can go. You have to cut through this one perp perpendicularly all the time. That is going to be the shortest path that will take you to the ground. You guys with me to this? If I want to head into this direction, but Dan, you have to go here. Cut through it. Cut perpendicularly. Cut down here. You have to do it perpendicularly. That will be the quickest path. If you want to go in this direction, you have to go here, cut here, cut there, cut here, cut here perpendicularly all the time. See? So wherever you head to, you have to go down here and cut this whole thing perpendicularly, perpendicularly, perpendicularly all the time. And now do you see what I'm at? <laughs> the yellow curve here, guys. That is your potential. Wow. This is your V. And the red line right there that give you the direction there, the one that give you a cut. Okay, let me draw nicely here. I'm just gonna need the arrow here. The cut here perpendicular, 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 everywhere here. That is your what, guys? Yeah, that's your electric field vector. Okay.
I don't know does this help or not, but that's the relationship between the potential function and the electric fields. And actually, the relationship between these two is just the formula that we use over here. This, this formula allows you to figure out the vector that is point perpendicular to the contour lines derived from the functions given. And that's exactly the property of the electric field that we face since the beginning of the introduction of the electric fields. Remember this one? If you have electric field pointing to your right, yeah, that blue curve there, that gives you the layer of constant potential value, right? See, they are perpendicular. So you can think backward. If you have that blue dashed lines, you can cut through these lines perpendicularly, you will get the electric field back. You see the relationship between the two, it's like this all the time. Back in the Coulomb's law, Point charge will generate the field going outward. So if you cut this field perpendicularly, you will get the layer of constant potential value. So that's why the layer of this one will give you a sphere. And what is this sphere? It's KQ over R. <laughs> Does that make sense? While the electric field at each point is KQ over R squared. R hat. See that? So the electric field from a point charge cuts or points perpendicularly to the contour line that's generated from the potential. KQ over R. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I find I thought at first time I saw this, like, okay, wow, this is cool. You have the mathematical tools ready for this. This operation over here connect potential function to the vector, give you the direction that cut through the potential contour map perpendicularly all the time. And the negative side that you slap in here and in there just to agree with our agreement that we define the potential. I'm sorry, we define the electric field to point from high potential to lower potential. So that's why we need the negative sign. Okay, the negative sign just to go, uh, just to signify that E go from high to low. So that's why you have to go the negative way. Okay, if you study this from calculus, the derivative is always, when you have positive derivative, mean that you have an increasing function, right? But because in physics, we define electric field to point from high potential to low. And that's the reason why we have to slap that negative sign in the front, just to flip the vector down to point to a lower value of potential all the time. And that is it that I want to show you guys today, guys. Okay. Uh, you know, you know, something yeah. <laughs> all right, so for those of you that uh, saw this, already maybe once or twice from calculus. This is in the topics of gradients vector. It's a vector gradient. Finding the gradients of a function allow you to figure out the gradients vector that give you the directions that point in the direction that the change of the function is the steepest or the quickest change of the original scalar function, okay? But for those of you that don't do anything about this vector calculus just yet, that is okay. As we said, the recipe is simple. It's just like, even though you don't know, understanding the underlying sort of like things of this formula, but it's just like, I'm giving you the components of this and you just cook according to the recipe. <laughs> if you are given the V, taking the derivative with respect to the coordinates one by one, slap in the negative sign, you get the electric field in that coordinates components and you are done. Okay. Okay, all right, so that's kind of nice for the exam point of view because if I give you this kind of problem, everyone should be able to figure out the electric field. And this is like a guarantee. You get some points out of this for sure. Okay, guys? All right, so I'll leave one just for later. We can just go back and take a look at this one, but this one, I think this is DIY. So if you want to take this one and see if you can, execute this problem. If it is good, then that will be it for 
the relationship between the field and the potential through vector calculus. Yeah, it's a differential kind of thing. Yeah. Whew. All right. It's long story today, guys. It's kind of like a lot of stuff to take. Any questions so far? Okay. If not, that is it, guys, for today. Thank you for sticking around. And I will see you guys on Saturday, right? And we have a Q&A if you want to stop by before the exam. So I will be uh, hosting a Zoom session from 8 a.m. or maybe a little bit later because from last time, nobody shows up that early. So, <laughs> but anyway, I will be uh, standing by from 8 until noon because uh, I will have another session for the section two as well. So you can feel free to stop by at any time. Yeah, it doesn't have to be 8 to 10. It can be any time before exam time. Okay, sounds like a good plan. All right, guys. So uh, take care, and I'll see you guys on Thursday, uh, on Saturday for the exam. Okay, bye-bye, guys. Thank you.